tournaments. Chess, gaming, sports, there's a tournament scene for everything. But I bet when you think of tournaments, here's what doesn't come to your mind. The Settlers of Catan. It's a new season for Catan's competitive scene, and I'm having an amazing time traveling to Philadelphia for my first tournament. My dream is to win US Nationals and play for US in the World Championship Series. But while I'm having a great time traveling, the loss of New York City is still stuck in my head. That New York champion who won the tournament will be here, so I have a chance to prove myself and beat him. All right, so I just arrived. Um, tournament day is today. Look forward to this. See all the crush of the gathering outside. Oh, yeah, this is probably going to be a really, really tough tournament. Usually tournaments at um, early season are really tough because basically there's a rule that most people don't know. After you win a regional Catan tournament, you can't play at any more tournaments for the rest of the season unless you voluntarily give up your spot at nationals to compete again. So since this is the new season of 2022, I see a lot of old crushers here. Uh, it is going to be a fun, uh, fun one to play. It's going to be a tough, but fun one to play for sure. And that's it. I'm here. It's a three-player game instead of four players. I'm the first to place and I choose the 8, 9, 10. It has two useful ports, the wood and the wheat. It also has some strong ore and strong brick spots as second settlement outs. So now it's Blue's turn and he chooses the 8, 9, 11, trying to utilize the strong road potential as the roads will be a lot more valuable on this board because of the open space. So Red chooses to go in the 6, 10, 12 and the 6, 4. So while this is an ore wheat sheep setup, the problem is that Red is getting below average production. While the sheep port can find its utility, it's not enough to compensate for the lack of production for Red's position, especially in a three-player game where there's a ton of extra open space. If it was me, I probably would have gone something like the 256 and the 9611, focusing on strong wood brick. So after Red's placements, things are a lot more interesting. Blue's placement now goes on the 6911. This isn't the best scenario for Blue, as they're only on three resources, the brick, ore, and wood. While they do have a brick port, it'll take a long time for them to get there without any wheat or sheep. Furthermore, without wheat, Blue will have a lot of excess ore stuck in their hand because you need wheat to match with ore. Remember about my channel, no wheat equals defeat. Now, it's back to me. I place on the 4910, starting with the wood and a brick to eventually build on the 31011. I have a ton of space on this board and I'm quite optimistic about this game. <laughs> okay, good luck y'all. It's my turn now to let the teacher and me give you a lesson about negotiations 101. Do you need sheep battle? I start off the negotiation by offering them the thing they need, which is the sheep. But because I'm tracking, I ask for the extra ore, which nets me a city. We close the deal and I drop the city on the 8, 9, 10. With this crucial city, I dominate the rest of the game quite quickly and finish the game with the other two players at six points. It's very important to be extremely precise in Catan, as one trade mistake can have a large cascading effect on the rest of the game. Wait, that should be nine, right? Oh, victory point. So I just finished round one and uh, it came up with a win. So I was pretty happy with that. The three player game, people overestimate or we cheat. With that wind under my belt, I'm off to play round two. God. Crush it. So, uh, I lost the footage, but I did win the game. I won the game. Back to round three. For round three, I'm in the second position. First position takes a 6 5 10. This is a strong spot on the board, as White has access to both strong ore and wheat and has access to two ports. I'm in the second position and I choose the 8, 9, 11. It gives me strong ore and wheat. I anticipate getting a sheep spot on the way back, such as the 249, the 65, the 246, or the 4612. All of those spots work well with my setup. Third position takes the 6, 10, 11, the last strong remaining ore spot. Fourth position take the 6, 4, 12, and the 3, 5, 8, giving them a starting road. Blue Knight takes the 6-5 sheep wood, giving them all five resources and they point their road to the 10-11. However, I think that's playing with fire, as Blue still has two other players that place after them, and they point towards a wood brick spot, which can get Blue cut off instantly. It's my turn, and I place on the remaining sheep spot. While I could place on the 3-5-11 and go on the wood port, which is a strong move, it's essential to think defensively. If I place on the 3-5-11, I will leave open the 249, which makes White's setup very strong, as they have all five resources, good or wheat sheep, and strong expansion spots. In fact, if I choose a 249, White will most likely go on the 3511 and want to secure the 1011, cutting off Blue. I want Blue to be cut off because we are competing against each other for the largest army. Therefore, by choosing the 249, I'm inducing a cutoff from one of my opponents. As it's White's turn, they do exactly what I predicted and cut off Blue at the very start with the starting wood and brick. So, the game begins. My game starts off pretty slow, but Orange secures the 8-3 and White settles on the 310. I get solo blocked by the robber pretty early, stifling my game. I eventually built a single road to the 3-1 port, but I'm still very behind this game. Now Orange pulls ahead and is at 6 points. Now I think White's position in this game is quite strong. They have the wood port, potential to get to the brick port, double brick spots, double wood spots, 
and two ore spots, making them unblockable. However, I think the greatest weakness is that White is going to face some fierce longest road competition. Orange has already built up a strong longest road network and built eight roads. It's going to be very expensive for White to compete for the longest road. So on my turn, I have two sheep, three wood, three ore, and one wheat. I'm so close to building a settlement or city. I try to trade. You want sheep at all? No. I don't know what you want. Because I'm tracking, I know that White has a high amount of wood in their hand. I play an aggressive knight and rob from White. With that wood, I'm able to do a four to one trade for a week in order to build the city. Although playing aggressive knights aren't always recommended, when you know you can make your hand actionable with an aggressive knight and with tracking, it can be a very good play. Now, I talk a lot about card tracking, but the truth is, is that it gets harder and harder as the game goes on because the cards get more shuffled. For me, my tracking accuracy plummets around halfway through the game. And that's why I think it's essential to practice the skill. I personally find the best way to practice this is by recording your games when playing online like a ton. And that's why I play in Colonist.io, which is the leading free platform for online like a ton. You can set up a multiplayer match in less than 10 seconds and test your skill and practice tracking. I personally really like playing private games with your friends and hopping on a voice call as it replicates in-person Gaton very well. So go check out colonist.io in the link down below to play on like a ton 100% free. Thank you colonist for sponsoring this video. Now on my turn, I build a settlement for my fourth point. I've gotten robbed and solo blocked a lot in this game, but it's understandable since it looks like I have a strong position. Now Orange is actually doing quite well in this position as they have a strong longest road network sitting at seven points and a down development card, putting them potentially at eight. I, I get everybody's stone. Yeah. This is a very strong swing for Orange as they needed a city since they're out of settlements. Orange is now sitting at eight points. But when someone is close to winning, it's best for the entire table to work together and take down the leader in a coordinated effort. Now two fives roll, giving a bunch of wood and brick to White. White gets a trade to extend the longest road and builds the 12 roads, tying Orange in the road race. Now White is asking me for two wood so they can build two more roads. If I give White these two more roads, they actually lock longest road for the rest of the game. If I don't give White the longest road, Orange could build one more road connecting the roads to make a longest road length of 14. This would make White have to fight even harder for the longest road and build all the way to 15 roads just to lock the longest road. Knowing this, I have a lot of leverage. I ask for a two for four trade from White in order to squeeze them and empty their hand. But I'm still playing with some serious fire by giving them this trade. They build a city in the 3511, now sitting at eight points, potentially nine. I do a trade with the blue here, giving them two wheat for wood and a brick. This allows me to do two roads and a settlement on the 8-4 putting me at eight points. Giving Blue the two wheat is dangerous as it completes a city for them, which puts them at eight points with a down development card that could be a victory point, potentially putting them at nine. I'm willing to take the risk though, because I can quickly win the game with a few nines or eights roll. However, on Blue's turn, this happens. Drama ensues. Two, four, six, eight, and a death. Like you could win on your turn, he could win on his turn, anybody could win on your turn at this point. I agree, but that's why I'm saying go trade. I could trade with her, I could trade with you. It really doesn't matter. What a brick. Anybody got a brick to give up? You have a stone? I do. Is this giving a win? Yeah. It takes you seven minutes to fuck me. It sucks, doesn't it? Good job. Show the camera your victory point. Alright, so game three just happened at the prelims. I'm Orange had zero chance of winning and traded blue when blue could potentially be sitting at nine points. Uh, the guy who took road kind of screwed him over. And that's kind of supposed to not be allowed. Blue did end up winning with that. It seems like Orange intentionally gave away the win. But, uh, once again, you can't really rule based off intent, unless you say it on camera. It's impossible to prove any type of intent, as Orange could have done the trade thinking it was a good trade. In situations like these, I just like to move on. Winning the first two rounds and getting eight points advances me to the semifinals, putting me as a second seed of the tournament. As I hear the brackets being called, I realize I matched against the previous New York champion. I had lost in New York City and I didn't want to lose again. If I lose, I'm knocked out of the tournament. If I win, well, I just took down the New York champion and advanced to the finals. Now, in the semifinals, you get to choose your position. I got second. You're gonna go second? Uh, I'm gonna go first. Okay. Yeah, let's go third. Okay. <laughs> well, I don't know guys, I don't know. I guess I'll go fourth. <laughs> I was the first to choose my positioning as I was the highest seed in this game. I chose the second position on this board because I thought I would be able to get one of the strong ore spots such as the 6911 or the 6410. Both of these spots have strong second settlement options such as the 89, the 258, the 58, the 59, or one of the 51011s. This would leave me pretty flexible to make strong decisions in order to play efficiently and have winning chances. So, the New York champion is playing as red, and I'm playing extra cautiously. Red starts off placing first, choosing the 6-9-11. The New York champion could take a gamble and point their road to the right, 
but it's risky considering that someone would probably take the 6410, which means one of the second settlement outs could easily be the 59. Now, third position takes the 61011 and points down, which I think is interesting. As third pick, there are two pairs of identical spots that pretty much do the same thing. The first pair, the 61011 and the 81011. And the second pair, the 582 and the 58 or the 89. How can I get the best version of each of these pairs? Looking at the or wood brick spots, I think that the 81011 is a much better spot as it's more likely that the 8 or won't be shared because the 8310 is kind of weak. You also have the benefits of accessing the 3 to 1 port or pointing your road the other way to potentially build to the 51011 or the 511 and even snaking your way all the way to the wood port. Some of the problems with the 61011 is that you're trapped in the middle of the board and pointed towards two wood brick spots while being in third position. It's basically asking to be cut off by another player at the very beginning of the game. As third position here, I'd either take the 58 or the 89, anticipating either getting the 61011 or the 81011. So, in the fourth position, Blue takes the 8312 and the 51011. What Blue did was very interesting as it placed in a way where it's very unlikely Blue will be sharing any spots with their opponents. The best way to utilize this position as Blue is to pace yourself so your opponents are never forced to rob you as it results in a solo block. Now, White takes a 258 and points to the sheet port. There is some merit of taking the 58 directly to immediately get access to the sheet port, but that comes at the cost of losing the wood and the ability to get easy settlement spots on the 8 sheep and the 5 wheat. Now, it's my turn in the second position. As I thought, the 89, 2910 are open. So, if I choose the 2910, it means that red would get the 89. If I choose the 89, red would take the 2910. This power to control where red plays is the reason why I chose second position. If I play on the 2910, I'd be able to play a solid longest road game on a board where the wood and brick is scarce. I'd be able to expand to the 632, the 3 to 1 port, the 5 3, or the 3 4 12, and quickly build cities with double ore and eventually double wheat. And I'm able to connect my roads together for a strong longest road network. This strategy would also only require 3 to 4 sheep the entire game, as I'm mostly building cities and roads. Furthermore, if I place on the 2910, Red places on the 8-9 give them an excess of sheep, so I can easily get them through stealing or trading. However, the biggest flaw with the 2 9 10 is that my setup isn't flexible. If one of my opponents cuts me off or takes away one of my central settlement spots, I'm dead in the water and can't win. Therefore, I choose the 8-9 because it gives me the flexibility to fight for the longest road or the largest army based on the game state. Sorry for the long explanation. Every one of these decisions I could talk three times as long about, but that just doesn't do well on YouTube. Sometimes though, I just can't help myself and want to fully explain the beauty and complexity of these decisions. But if you're interested, check out my second channel down below where I talk way more in depth about Catan strategy. So, Red takes a 2910 and points right to the 236 with a starting road. Alright, good luck everybody. Good luck. The game begins with Red securing the spot on the 236 and White quickly getting a spot for the sheep port. I buy dev card and the robber quickly lands on the 10 brick. I don't want to play. I don't want to play the knight class because I want to defend my more important spots such as the 6 ore, the 8 sheep, and the 9 wheat, which are all shared with one other player, meaning it's going to get blocked and blocked a lot. Everyone is sitting at 3 points now. Red has coordinated wheat and sheep spots on the 9, 2 ore spots with the 6s, and the double wood and brick. This puts Red in a strong position. Red quickly progresses to the 5-3, setting them up for a strong road network to get the longest road and to build cities with the double wheat and double ore hexes. But I'm not too far behind myself as I dropped the first city of the game on the 4-6-10. This makes me a lot more flexible. If the 10 rolls, my brick turns into any card with the brick port. If the 4 rolls, my wood turns into any card with the 3-1 to one port. This increased flexibility can help me adapt to any sudden changes of the game. Suddenly, Blue comes out of nowhere and calls Monopoly. Oh. 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 Wow. Okay. Yeah. Tides have shifted now. I'm kind of scared. Yeah. I'm sorry. I didn't know she had a Monopoly. Blue buys a city and a development card, putting her at five points. And to top it off, one turn later, they play a knight card. Taking the largest army, Blue takes the longest road, putting Blue at nine points. Now, Blue is extremely close to winning the game. They still have enough to buy a development card and win with a victory point. There are a total of five victory points out of the development card deck of 25 cards. But I have two of the victory point cards, so it's a one out of six chance to win. I hold my breath and wait. The table dodged a bullet. The entire table needs to work together in order for all of us to survive more rounds. If the table does not work together to try to take down Blue, the tournament run will be over for all of us. It's essential to do three things. One, take away their win conditions, like largest army and longest road. Two, block them and steal from them. And three, deny them trades. So, on Red's turn, I trade away my road materials for them to take away longest road from blue in a desperate move to try to prolong the game. And I buy development card, a monopoly. That 
is a game changer. The table is working together in a coordinate effort. They see the threat. After some calculation, okay. I, monopoly wheat. I play Monopoly to get five wheat total. This was essential, as I wanted to take away the two wheat from Blue's hand, as the eight rolling gives three ore and lets Blue go to city. If I didn't play Monopoly, Blue could still have winning chances by rolling combinations of an eight and a wood, or eight and a break to take the longest road back and drop a city for the win. Therefore, I felt like the monopoly was forced. With the extra wheat, I dropped the city myself. Red extends two more roads, which puts the table in a less of a danger zone for Blue to win. White now drops the city themselves and is sitting at six points with a down development card. However, White follows it up with another city on the 258 and drops a road to the 3412. White can win with a few fives and sixes. Blue can also connect the roads and take away the longest road to threaten the win too. On Blue's turn, they drop a city, putting them at eight points. All they have to do now is to connect the roads to take the longest road and win the game. But they drop the road to the five wheat instead. This is quite the mistake as it makes it much harder for Blue to connect their roads, reducing their winning chances. Now on Red's turn, they trade with White, but I mumble. How many cards do you have? White has a stack of cards and it's outs to win through combinations of a settlement and a city, or two cities. But Red reminds me, it's not just about White as they drop a settlement for eight points themselves. However, on my turn... Eight. That's a city. Yeah. No, that's it. Yes. Okay. If I yeah. didn't roll a seven, I could have won my turn. <laughs> I thought you could have, I thought you could have. Yeah. I did it. I took down the Newark Regional Champion and I'm playing in the finals. So here I was sitting at the final table of a regional tournament. How do I look? Okay, you you look got good. me in the frame? Uh, if you do that, you, know, you can go down a little bit more. Yeah. 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 <laughs> I was the second seed of the tournament and the first seed decided to go in the third position. I chose the second position. So the first placement on the board was a 3-4-8. I think I'd be concerned about getting a good second settlement with a 3-4-8 pick. I probably would have picked either the 5-6-10 or the 8-4-10, but the 3-4-8 still isn't bad. Now, in my position, I have a decision. The 4810 or the 5610. The 4810 has a double wheat spots along with the wheat port, making it very difficult for my opponents to be blocking me on the wheat. Whereas the 5610 has a problem of getting the 10 wheat spot shut down hard by the robber. The 4810 commits hard to getting the largest army, while the 5610 allows for flexibility by either going for the largest army or the longest road. It's a tough call as both spots are good with their own benefits, but I calculated that the 4810 would most likely give me the 4912 as a second settlement which is decent. Maybe sometimes the 8-9, a very strong spot, or the 6-9, which is also strong. I'd like to get the good stuff, then. I don't think there's anybody Ooh, can prevent you. really? <laughs> I don't think there's anybody can prevent you from getting that. Third position now picks the 5-6-10, which is a super solid spot. Now fourth position takes a 3-4-5 and the 6-9-2. Their picks make a lot of sense as they anticipate getting the 2-5-11 or the 5-6 to be open, and also hope the 9-12 will be available too. But as a consequence of their placements, the board is wide open for third position. Third position has amazing options on this board, most notably the 8-9. This gets White all five resources, access to the 3-1 port, and decent ore wheat. But White had other ideas in mind. I go wood or 8-9? Let's have some fun, boys. Basically, White was thinking, if he took the 8-9, I would take the 4912, and Blue would get the 3610. White took a defensive approach and prevented Blue from having a strong setup by taking the 3610. When White doesn't go on the 89, I'm ecstatic because I get the 89 to myself. Now, I could be greedy and point my road to the sheep port as I'm on double sheep hexes. I play safe with the 8 war and I'm very happy with the 3 to 1 port. Blue places on the 4912 and points the road to the sheep port. I think Blue's road to the sheep port is extremely risky as a challenging orange to a race. Orange starts off with a wood brick in hand, and Blue doesn't even produce any brick. Furthermore, the benefit of the sheep port is very marginal. If I was Blue, I'd simply point my road to the coast and be happy with a 3-1 to port on the 9 ore. Finally, the fight for a spot at US Nationals begins. Hey, good luck everybody. Oh, thank you. Thank you. Good luck. I've played against White before in another tournament finals, and won, and I'm sure that he remembers that and will be watching me closely this game. He's by far the opponent that I'm most scared of. And immediately, White springs their plan into action and plows me onto the 811, which is devastating for my game. This makes it so I no longer have access to the wheat port and a precious settlement spot. This move puts me behind, and I need every little advantage I can get. Yeah, keep for non block. I'm willing to give up a sheep for my 8 ore not to be blocked. Fighting for little advantages like this pays off handsomely when I roll an 8 and drop a city on the 4810. This city is massive and will allow me to buy tons of development cards. But just as I'm starting to think I'm back in the game, White has ideas of their own. You want two wheat for a wood? Yeah. Okay. 
This is a pretty big swing in the game since white now has the wood port online. You can build a bunch of roads to exert the longest road dominance. Now orange finally makes his first moves and drops two roads to the 912, which absolutely cripples blue as now he's cut off for a second time. Now orange blocks my eight sheep here. With my setup, the main thing I can do is buy development cards to get knights to take the largest army. And my opponents would realize that and correctly block the eight or instead to stop my or income. On my turn, I decide to not play a knight and leave the robber on the eight sheep as I start stacking development cards. So maybe you could force him to... Yeah, I, I, I do have a knight. I do have a knight. So the thing is, uh, we share this spot, and I'm not going to move it on my sheep at all. I already produced two times. Yeah. So if, he's, if you don't, if you put it here, uh, we have more protection for that before. I'm also going to trade your sheep at all. Just because like, if you need sheep at all, since that's something you don't reproduce, I'm going to trade that. But I think you, you should... Just... I didn't listen to anything. Oh, okay, okay, fine. <laughs> In this position, white is very close to winning. White has been buying development cards and playing knights, getting them the largest army, putting them at seven points. The problem is that no one has taken the longest road. When white takes the longest road, now they're gonna be sitting at nine points, a few rolls away from winning the tournament. Again, the table needs to work together in a coordinated effort in order to survive. In my position, I keep buying development cards to take away the largest army. In orange's position, they build roads to take away the longest road. And in blue's position, well, they just kind of sit there. Blue trades an ore to white for a brick to build a road, but they build it to the four wheat ore port instead of the eight ore. This is quite an important move. Now, with the longest road taken by orange, suddenly the table starts targeting me. The table starts talking about taking my settlement spots away because I don't make any wood or brick. The eight ore spot is the only easy settlement spot for me. And blue fails to recognize that and builds a road towards a four wheat ore port instead of the eight ore. Without blue exploiting my weakness, I can slowly take time to collect resources and eventually build on the eight ore. Now I'm sitting at five points with three victory points hidden. My last step is to take the largest army, but everyone is constantly robbing on me and focused on my position. However, it's too late for my opponents. I play one night after another, taking the largest army and winning Where the Largest army? You get GG. This was a very tough tournament. I'm grateful to win. For everyone that believed in me, thank you. I believe that anyone could make it to nationals. You just gotta study, play with the good players, and watch yep. our videos, and subscribe. And subscribe. <laughs> <laughs> All right, nationals 2022. Here we come.